Good afternoon and welcome to the Newark Public Library's 2021 Black History Celebration, the art and beauty of Black power. Today's program, Free Black Communities, the Underground Railroad and Slavery, Telling and Researching the Stories is our final presentation of the series. We thank the PNC Foundation for their generous support of our Black History celebration this year. My name is Reggie Blanding and I'm a librarian at the James Brown African American Room of the Newark Public Library in Newark, New Jersey. On behalf of our director, Jocelyn Bowling Dixon and Board of Trustees President, Dr. Lauren Wells, we thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape First Nations on which we are learning, laboring, and organizing today. We also recognize the devastation and the continued legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, which contributed to present day systemic racism and oppression. Our space at the library, the James Brown African American Room was named in honor of the late James Library Brown a librarian, poet, activist, and influencer who was instrumental in making sure that the library sought and maintained books and resources and was presented programs examining and celebrating the African-American experience. Mr. Brown was especially committed to urging Newark youth to pursue education and to understand the importance of the library's role in their academic growth. This year, our exhibit, Black Power, 19th Century, Newark's First African-American Rebellion and related programs reflect the research, artistry, and vision of my awesome colleague, Noelle Lorraine Williams. Black Power is one of the most controversial terms of the 20th century. Newark's 1960s Black Power Movement and the 1967 Rebellion dominate discussions about African-American activism in Newark. And for good reason, it was a uh, wake up call against the racism and violence that stalked black lives. However, many of the powerful ideals about saving black lives that are evident in the black liberation struggles in the 60s, in the 1960s, were also evident and, sh and shaped by those in the 1800s. Uh, we ask you to visit the virtual ex exhibit Black Power. You can go access that through the library's homepage www.npl.org, which will give you the information about all of our Black History celebrations, all of our previous Black History celebrations and the Black Power exhibit. You can view these programs that you may have missed. Uh, now I'd like to bring on my colleague, my fellow James Brown African American Room Librarian, Dale Colston. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you. And Noel, I just want to say it's been a pleasure to have worked with you over these past several months. We started this in the summer and um, um, just a pleasure to work with you and much continued success on everything that you do. Thank you. Noel Lorraine Williams lives and works in Newark, New Jersey. She is a graduate of the New School for Social Research and Rutgers University, Newark. As a public humanity specialist, artist, researcher and curator, her work examines the ways African Americans utilize culture to reimagine liberation in the United States. Her work as an artist and curator has been reviewed in the Star Ledger, New York Times, Art News, and other publications. Last year, the exhibition she curated at the North Public Library, Radical Women, was the recipient of the Giles R. Wright Award for Contributions to African American History in New Jersey. She is a recipient of the 2021 Individual Artist Fellowship Awards from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Noelle Lorraine Williams. Thank you, Dale. Um, I'm so happy to be here and to welcome everyone on this beautiful March 6th afternoon uh, for the conclusion of the Art and Beauty of Black Power, um, the series that it is hosted and funded by both 
PNC Foundation. And this last panel is actually a joint funding between PNC Foundation and the New Jersey Historical Commission. So before we start the panel, I just wanna do a quick overview um, for folks about free black communities here in the New Jersey, as well as in the country. So the first thing, actually I'm going to share my screen with everyone. So one of the essential things um, that we need to remember about free black communities is that they are a combination of various African-American people, um, communities, neighborhoods, uh, places. So for example, here in New Jersey, we have various free and enslaved communities that are actually composed of people who are both free and enslaved. Um, again, thank you to our generous funders, uh, the New Jersey Historical Commission who funded the fabrication of this exhibition as well as partial funding of this um, panel and PNC Foundation. So Black Power 19th century, it highlights the courage and public discourse of free Black communities. So as I mentioned, free Black communities here in Newark, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Philadelphia, Camden, and also other parts of um, New Jersey, including Lawnside, um, East Brunswick, New Brunswick, are composed of free and enslaved people. So it highlights this exhibition and this panel will highlight um, the courage and public discourse of free black communities. So here I'm gonna show you a clip from one of the videos that we have in the exhibition. It's Kali Raymond performing the poem written by Reverend Ellie Moss Payson, who was a pastor here in Newark at the Plain Street Colored Church. And he wrote this poem, um, which I'm going to play an excerpt of, for his friend Jermaine Lugan, who was a leader in the um, Underground Railroad in New York, and also a, um, free, a freedom seeker in New York. I fled from Tennessee, from chains, wits, and bloodhounds too, in search of liberty. That's why I stared, I saw my sister flawed, and heard her thrilling prayer, Oh, spare me, master, master, for God's sake, master, spare me, please. I and my mother felt the lash, our sufferings, who can tell? Oh, slavery, thou bloody fiend, I hate thee, worse than hell. And now, they wish to drag me back to servitude again, but never, no, so God help me, will I do the chain? I would not turn upon my heel to flee my master's power, but if he comes within my grasp, he can force the self. Same hour. And so we also profiled the continuing of this legacy. So here on the right, you see Brenda Morick, who is actually the daughter of um, both a great, her great grandfather, who was a black abolitionist in Newark and Manhattan, and her grandfather, Adam Ray, um, who was also a black abolitionist and activist in Newark. And she became a Harlem Renaissance writer um, who did work both in Washington DC and Harlem. So the exhibition gives you the oppor opportunity to see how these free black communities, free black and freedom fighter, freedom seeker communities developed. Um, we also profile, we, what we're doing in this exhibition and what we're doing in today's talk is we're reframing 
these women and men and children who are often called runaway slaves, and we're calling them freedom seekers. And we highlight their roles as leaders in Black communities. So I'm going to show an excerpt from another video that we feature um, in the exhibition. about 27 years of age, a slave for life. Also a female child aged two years. The woman is a healthy, good natured, a good cook, or would suit a farmer, being more or less accustomed to that work. The owner is going out of the state, and the woman ran away, but is now confined in Newark jail. Under these circumstances, the woman and her child will be sold at $100. Apply to Jafiah Harrison, Newark, March 26, 1816. And on to the right, you see a picture of Samuel Ward who again was a freedom seeker um, whose mother ran away uh, from Maryland when he was a baby and he eventually became um, a black abolitionist and underground railroad leader. He's also one of the leaders in the Jerry's Rescue for those who are familiar with that famous case. Finally, one of the um, things that Black Power 19th Century does and that we're also going to discuss in this uh, panel is that Black Power 19th Century visualizes the erased Black activists and abolitionist community here in Newark. It also makes connections to the other Black activist communities in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and, the great, and other sites in greater New Jersey. So um, for example, this is a model that we did for the exhibition that shows the community in Newark. That's now considered the Frederick Douglass um, field at Rutgers. And to the right, you can see um, this is a section on the website that says Black Power 19th Century New Jersey Maps. So now I'm pleased to continue with our panel. Um, and so the first uh, panelist that I will introduce will be Christopher, Dr. Let me say it properly, Dr. Christopher Matthews. Dr. Christopher Matthews is a historical archaeologist and professor of anthropology at Montclair State. His research interests are the archaeology of capitalism and race in the United States and the practice of community-based research. His work is focused on sites associated with slavery and freedom, and he has directed field projects in Maryland, Louisiana, New York, and New Jersey. He earned his PhD in anthropology from Columbia University in 1998. He's also the author of two books, An Archaeology of History and Tradition and The Archaeology of American Capitalism. He's also the co-editor of Ethno Ethnographic Archaeologies, Reflections on Stakeholders, and Archaeological Practice, as well as the author of several book chapters and articles and journals. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Matthews. Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and to uh, talk about uh, something I've done recently uh, that uh, I, I'd like people to know about. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat if that's a good way of doing it. I'm also going to share my screen in a minute. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, what I'm talking about and what I just linked is an essay I wrote on uh, titled The Black Freedom Struggle in Early New Jersey, 16 13 to 1860, uh, and the, the link I just posted is to where it is uh, housed on the Montclair State website. Uh, it's a, it was a project I was, uh, uh, that I decided to do because I was getting um, settled in New Jersey as a researcher, and my focus has always been on African and Native American communities, and so I felt I needed to read the literature on 
uh, produced by historians and others on the history of, of Black communities, especially during the time of slavery, uh, and be able to share that in a, in a document that would be, you know, for my own references initially, but when I shared it with others, folks said, hey, you should, uh, you should get this circulated. There's a lot of great information in here. So it's uh, I, I'm always happy to hear the work you do uh, being recognized and certainly happy to be and thrilled to be sharing it now today. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and just uh, to give a little bit of a few pieces of that essay uh, in the in the time I have to speak with you all today. Uh, let me see if I can make that work. Um, with any luck. My screen is shared, and you can see my opening slide. Um, um, make sure that it's um, prop. Make sure you're hitting the share screen, and then um, clear it. Okay, I thought I did. I maybe picked the wrong screen. Yeah. Thanks, Noel. Oh, sure. Is that better? Yes, that that's awesome. Okay, so that's the 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 website homepage. Now I just have to switch over to my slides, if I can make those work. All right, we see the slides now, Noelle? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, what this essay does is it's in six different pieces, which tra traces sort of the history of African-American experience in New Jersey from the very beginning of the colonial period all the way through to the time of the Civil War. Uh, obviously, it's a long stretch. I can't spend uh, a lot of time on any particular piece, but I, what I've decided to do is just share with you some really wonderful statements that are in the historical record. Wonderful in that sense of what they give us in terms of information, but not necessarily always wonderful in what they tell us about the experiences of African people. Um, the first one was written by an iron um, uh, factory developer named Peter Hassenklever. Some of you might know that northern New Jersey was a, an iron producing area up in the mountains and Hassan Cleaver was the first person to really bring a lot of capital behind him. Uh, and as he was traveling to go see where he had purchased land, he penned this statement describing traveling up the Passaic River. We appear to have been suddenly transported to the Netherlands, he writes, and many of you probably know that the Dutch were the original settlers of northern New Jersey. Continuing, he writes, the Dutch are settled throughout this fertile river valley. The roads are lined with the fields of prosperous looking farms, in some cases, hundreds of acres. They are able to maintain such large properties by the use of slaves. I saw dozens of them hoeing in the furrows, men, women, and children often singing in a deep, mournful, mournful sounding way. Uh, the, the reason I wanna share this is just to put in front of everyone that the fact that slavery, especially in Northern New Jersey and Bergen County in particular, was normal, common, and every day. Uh, the experience of most people of African descent was it was through the experience of slavery, such that you can see here a very obvious presence that was familiar to Hassan Cleaver, but also something that we should have in the back of our mind when we think of how people who uh, lived through that experience, what their lives were like. Moving ahead quickly, I just thought I would spend some time on the American Revolution. Uh, this was a period of time when People uh, of African descent who had been enslaved in New Jersey found ways to uh, escape slavery uh, and uh, assert their um, independence and assert their freedom and assert their resistance. Um, one of the, the, the bases of that freedom was a decision by uh, loyalist uh, governors to offer freedom to any enslaved person if they would escape from where they lived and fight for the British against the Patriots. And, there was a poem written by a New Jersey uh, a planter who wrote a proclamation of late he send, this is in reference to the New York State, uh, New York colonial governor, to thieves and rogues who are his only friends, those he invites all colors he attacks, but deference play, pays to Ethiopian blacks. Uh, this was a, a reference to the, uh, the fact that the many, many African descended people did leave their farms and did leave their lives behind to fight with the British against the Patriots and therefore against many of their former masters. One of those was uh, a person who has a very interesting story and uh, as Noel mentioned, uh, what we used to call um, runaway slaves, which are advertised in the newspaper as people who ran away, we now see as either being self-emancipated or free, as freedom seekers. And this is uh, the advertisement put in by the slave owner of a man named Titus who escaped from Monmouth County. 
uh, and the interesting part was he never he never um, was captured, but rather returned with a new name, calling himself Colonel Ty. And Colonel Ty fought with the British and became famous for his ability to raid uh, farms in Monmouth County from his base in Staten Island, uh, where he proceeded to free as many people who were enslaved in in his former community as he could. And he became known and became very well known as a, uh, as a as a freedom fighter during the war. Obviously, the British appreciated him because he was fighting for them. But he was most likely, as you can see, fighting for the freedom of his fellow people of African descent. Um, in 1804, uh, I'm sure many of you know that slavery began to, to wind down in New Jersey. And like many other northern states, um, the, 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 the state decided they weren't going to set everyone free all at once uh, because that would be a difficult situation for the planters who were part of the constituency obviously, and, and quite invested in, um, in the preservation of slavery. So in 1804, the state passed the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, which stated that if a person was born to an enslaved mother after July 4th, 1804, they would be free once they served their masters for a term if a male until 25 years of age, and if a female until 21 years of age. And what's important about that is not only that that was a, you know, uh, a preservation of a form of slavery uh, through the youth and early adulthood of many people, but also in a, this act was never um, amended in any way. So in effect, it never it did not free any people at all. It also provided nothing to the young men and women upon the completion of their indenture, uh, which was the norm for white servants. And New Jersey, unlike every other state in the North, never amended the law to free those born before the act went into place. As such, slavery did not formally end in New Jersey until the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1865. New Jersey, in other words, was the last state in the North and one of the last states in the whole nation to uh, see the end of slavery, even though um, it decided, it mentioned, it, it, it put an initial effort out in 1804. Um, moving forward, Essentially, the experience after 1804 and into the 19th century was one of uh, with a, one filled with a lot of challenges for African Americans, uh, in which they faced uh, intensifying anti-Black racism. They faced vigilante white violence. Some of you uh, who are historians of Newark likely know that there were race riots in Newark where white vigilantes uh, attacked uh, and destroyed African American homes and property and threatened African American lives. Uh, and there were severe restrictions on their civil rights. African Americans, though, never gave up the fight for their freedom. And uh, for example, in response to colonization, which was an effort to remove people of African descent from, uh, from New Jersey and, and to resettle them in Africa as a way of solving the race problem, uh, most people of African descent chose to uh, not, not take that opportunity if you, if you would even consider it as such but rather like Peter Williams Jr., a New Jersey born uh, 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 preacher uh, wrote, we are natives of this country. We ask only to be treated as well as foreigners. Not a few of our fathers suffered and bled to purchase its independence. We ask only to be treated as well as those who fought against it. We have toiled to cultivate it and to raise to its present prosperous condition. We ask only to share equal privileges with those who come from distant lands to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Let these moderate requests be granted and we need not go to Africa or anywhere else to be improved and happy. And you can see the humility, but also erudition of this speaker who represents his people so well. Um, instead of leaving, uh, by, uh, and during the early 19th century, many of those who were formerly enslaved ended up settling in um, spaces where communities of, uh, of their own could be formed. Uh, one of the most well-known is called Skunk Hollow, which is a community that formed in northern Bergen County, right near the New York-New Jersey border in, in what is now Palisades Park. Uh, Skunk Hollow was home to about 75 people uh, in the 1880s, though it was founded in 1806 by a man named Jack Ernest. A similar uh, community to this was founded in Dunkerhook, uh, which is in Paramus, uh, and the Dunkerhook community was not quite as large as Skunk Hollow, probably only about 45 to 60 individuals. But what you see from these examples are these small rural communities were formerly enslaved and now free people and their descendants created um, communities for themselves. Both Skunk Hollow and Dunkerhook were home to not only 
residents, but also an African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, that served the, the, the larger African community surrounding them. And what's also interesting and related to uh, my own specialty is that both Skunkalo and Dunkerhook have been studied archaeologically. Uh, and Skunkalo, Skunkalo was studied uh, quite a while ago in the late 1970s. Um, but uh, Dunkerhook is, um, has been, has been uh, excuse me, I saw something in the chat that maybe I needed to stop. <laughs> uh, Dunkerhook is being investigated currently by myself and other colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, if I have a chance, I can talk more about that uh, field work that we're doing again this summer uh, later in this presentation. Um, let's see. I think I'll just move to this last slide. This is John S. Rock. Uh, he was involved in uh, a, uh, the, um, the New Jersey Anti-Slavery Society, which was founded in 1830 and fought against slavery, not only in you know, you know, the, the legacy of slavery in New Jersey, but also fought to put an end to slavery across the United States. Um, and John S. Rock has an interesting history. He was trained as a, uh, as a, uh, as a doctor. Uh, but was unable to practice medicine because of his race. He then retrained as a dentist and then studied law and was the first African American to be admitted to, let me get the words right here in my notes. Um, where are you hiding there? Uh, he, was, he, he was the first African American to be admitted to the bar of the US Supreme Court. And in 1847, he spoke against uh, the, uh, the inequalities he faced as a person, but also that his community at large faced writing that this the country a man is born in is his country and the humanity that would oppress a colored man for a white man's sake is not a humanity for us. And the man that will refuse to assist suffering humanity on account of color is undeserving the name of man. Our design in speaking frankly is not to upbraid you, but to show you our maltreatment and ask that you ameliorate our condition by giving us our rights. Obviously some very important and very significant and very erudite individuals were part of the African-American community in early New Jersey's history uh, as they fought to fought for their freedom, fought for their right to, to be residents, and fought for their civil rights and active in, in the way the society was organized. Uh, I will stop there and, oh, hold on, and go back here and make sure if I stop sharing my slides. Oh, I gotta hit this button. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Noelle, you're muted. Hey, Dr. Matthews, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say, um, Dr. Matthews posted the link to his essay earlier, but I just reposted it. It's a uh, www.montclair.edu anthropology research slavery in New Jersey. Um, it's essential if you're a researcher and you haven't um, in your research in New Jersey or African American history or 19th century history um, that you read his overview. It's a great overview of the contemporary literature, meaning like literature over the past hundred or so years that deals with African-Americans and New Jersey's and, and communities. So uh, please, if you don't have time, um, it's a, it's, um, it's, it's it's a it's a nice um, read. So it's not two pages. I, uh, Dr. Matthews, I forgot how many pages it is. Is it 20? Um, but please um, bookmark it and also um, share that link with your colleagues and your students because uh, it's a great overview of the literature. Um, and so now I will welcome Linda Shockley. Hello, Linda. Hello, thanks for having me. So I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Linda P. Shockley. She is the president and the founding member of the Lawnside Historical Society, Inc. in Lawnside, New Jersey, where she learned the unique history of the town that's shaped and governed by, Mac by African Americans. The society restored and it owns the Peter Mott House, an underground railroad museum named for an agent on that clandestine network to network for those 
escaping the network to freedom for those escaping enslavement. She served as the Secretary of Preservation New Jersey, a statewide historic preservation advocacy group, a commissioner of the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission, and a member of the New Jersey Review Board for Historic Sites. She was a Getty Diversity Scholar through the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She is the deacon at Grace Temple Baptist Church, Lawnside, where she co-chairs the Black History Ministry. Um, please join me in welcoming Ms. Linda P. Shockley. Thank you. And I'm going to try to share my screen as uh, deftly as Dr. Matthews did. Um, and I have confirmed it. I have done it, I think. And I'm going to start my presentation. Oh, yep, it's there. <laughs> All right, you see it. All right, so um, I call this presentation built on a foundation of families because that's essentially what we are. We were taught this history as children, but we didn't really grasp it. Some of our teachers were actually descendants of these families, and indeed, some of our, our schoolmates were people who were descended from these families. The Historical Society was really organized in 1990 because of the threat to the Peter Mott House, which we now call the Peter Mott House Underground Railroad Museum. We knew it was the oldest house in the community. We knew something about Peter Mott, but we didn't know a lot. And then when this development came along that wanted to build uh, 22 uh, townhouses on the property, we were alerted by Clarence Still, who was a descendant of uh, William Still and uh, actually became our first president and eventually the first uh, borough historian. So one of the things that uh, we've always leaned and depended on is the true story of Lawnside, written by Charles C. Smiley in 1921. Mr. Smiley uh, published this little 32 page pamphlet and we swore by whatever was in it. Um, one of the, the lovely uh, things that he wrote in the foreword was that um, people called our community Free Haven because it was a place of freedom to oppress people so much so that they with thankful hearts called it haven and the secrecy was to conceal their habitation from the oppressors. Now we were taught that our community originated through the beneficence of a Quaker from Haddonfield, a man named Ralph Smith who uh, paid for flats and then actually uh, sold them at very cheap cost to African-American people around 1840. Um, in truth and in fact, Mr. Smith was a member of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. Um, he was hired, um, he hired out uh, people, <clears throat> but he did not actually live in Haddonfield. He lived in Northern Liberties. He was a contemporary of um, Jacob C. White and William Still. Um, so he was involved in a very um, multi-ethnic opposition to oppression and slavery. Now, one of the other interesting things about Mr. Smiley um, is that he wrote this book, and I'm not going to deal at all with the, um, the uh, gradual abolition legislation, but he wrote this book and he sent out cards around the community to try to get people who had information to share it uh, with him. Uh, so it was a labor of love and it took him quite a while to publish it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to know was who was Peter Mott? And unfortunately, Mr. Smiley is silent on that question. Um, we were able to get the Mott House on the National Register of Historic Places in the New Jersey State Register. Uh, because pro bono, the director of the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission worked on the nomination. She unearthed this death certificate that showed us that Peter died in 1881. Um, we had found some research ourselves. I should say I'm not a researcher. I'm not a college professor. I'm not a professional historian. We scrambled around, we stumbled around and found this information in various places and the marriage records be found through the Gloucester County Historical Society because Camden County didn't exist 
in 1844 um, or 1832. So we had to uh, get creative and really uh, be guided by other folks. Another thing that we do know about Peter is that he was a Sunday school superintendent at Mount Pisgah AME Church. And by oral tradition, um, there are people still living who say that their grandparents and their great grandparents told them about his role in taking people in his wagon to the Society of Friends in Haddonfield and Morristown, which is the uh, Burlington County. So here is a contradictory census. And, and this is once again, the very slim information that we have about Peter. We know that um, he, he, um, he said he was a farmer and a laborer. And those arrows point to uh, the entry in 1850 census for him and his wife, Elizabeth Ann Thomas. Now, they indicate that they cannot read and write. If we look at the 1870 census, we'll find entries for Peter and Elizabeth Ann. In the 1850 census, they say that they were born in New Jersey. Okay, if they're in their 40s and they were born in New Jersey in 1850, that means they would have been born around 1810, well past the uh, act of gradual abolition. Okay, then in 1870, they indicate that they were born Peter in Delaware and Elizabeth Ann in Virginia. So the question becomes why the discrepancy? Well, we may think it's obvious if there are slave catchers about, so-called kidnappers, bounty hunters, and even in some cases, uh, US marshals or government officials, uh, it was prudent possibly to uh, misrepresent where you may have been born uh, because we just couldn't trust uh, the estate to uh, be fair and not bring people back into enslavement. So Peter, as a free man, um, was helping people escape slavery, or as a freedom seeker himself, he had that additional impetus to help his fellow man. Now, I mentioned um, <clears throat> Peter, uh, Charles, uh, excuse me, I mentioned Charles Smiley, and one of the things that's interesting about Mr. Smiley is that he did not only write a true story, a, a true story of Lawnside, he also wrote his family history. And his family history includes a liberation story. And it starts with Thomas Smelly of the county of, of Isle of Wight in the state of Virginia, who wrote in 1834 that he was providing freedom to his Negro man, Jim, and Negro woman, Amy, and giving them $100 each to be equally divided between them. He was also uh, willing to them the freedom of their children after a certain term of service. So Mr. Smiley uh, made a record of this. And fortunately for us, his third generation great granddaughter, um, whom we called Mom Beck Scott, actually uh, made a copy of this document and, and gave it to us. And, and here's what we have. Now, um, Mr. Smiley actually recorded into the fifth, sixth, and seventh generation. And uh, Mom Beck actually made notations until the eighth generation of people in her family. If you um, notice uh, to the right, we have um, uh, Peter Smiley, uh, who is a descendant, who um, had an, a grocery store. And this is one of the bills of sale um, from 1891. Um, on the other side, you see the annual Arthur Day program. This is a program that's held by a family who trace themselves to Hannah Davy James and Isaac Arthur, who are believed to have escaped to our community around 1840 from Snow Hill, Maryland. 
this family has been holding an annual Arthur Day, which is always the second Sunday in March at Mount Pisgah African Methodist Episcopal Church, where we remember Peter Mott was the Sunday school superintendent. Um, it's possible, but we have not been able to verify that Peter was the one who assisted the sibling in coming and settling in this area. Another family that we have is the Cooper family. They were headed by a man named Charles whose freedom was purchased for him by the Coopers of Haddonfield. Cooper is a very well-known name in this area. We have the Cooper River, we have Cooper Hospitals, we have all kinds of institutions uh, associated with the Coopers. Um, Charles' freedom was purchased for him. He uh, eventually married a woman from a, another uh, free settlement, a place that was called Fussell Town. He married Sidonia Fussell, and she eventually became Mom Cooper. Just a few uh, streets over from where I'm sitting, there is a complex of people who are descendants from uh, Charlie Cooper and Mom Cooper. Um, their, their properties are contiguous. Um, it's interesting to note that Charles Cooper Jr became the first, uh, one of the first council people when the borough of Lawnside was incorporated in 1926. The interesting thing is that we, we really don't know much about the people and their lives. We know their lineage. Um, and so that's one of our challenges as uh, lay people looking for help in, uh, putting some meat on these people's bones. Now I'm showing you Mount Peace Cemetery, which is an 11 acre cemetery. It was a segregated cemetery organized in 1902. Once again, people of color in the city of Camden and surrounding areas wanted a secular cemetery where their loved ones could be buried with dignity. Actually cemeteries in Camden city were beginning to, to be um, filled and they needed some place. And so they worked with the Willits family, which is a family of members of the Society of Friends who um, dedicated themselves to the upliftment of the Negro and Christian education. Um, and so they became uh, <clears throat> the, the people who uh, sold this property. It was 11 acres. And so we found that people were able to uh, find uh, a decent place for family burials. And we also found that we were seeing people from all kinds of uh, communities, including from the city of Philadelphia. Um, one of those people was a uh, Civil War veteran, John Henry Lawson, who received the Medal of Honor for his role in the Battle of Mobile Bay. He was aboard the USS Hartford. Um, Mr. Smiley once again tells us that 46 men from Lawnside went to the Civil War. And he's listing the names of those men, all returned uh, safely. But we don't know much more about these individuals. Um, this picture of the headstone here is of Cubitt Moore, who was a private in the 43rd Regiment. Um, is actually at Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Um, and then there's a headstone for Joseph Gray, who was aboard the USS Princeton during the Civil War. His headstone is at Mount Pisgah uh, AME Church. The unfortunate thing for us is that the church and the both churches felt that it was best to store their records in the caretaker's house of the larger cemetery, Mount Peace Cemetery. Um, however, the caretaker's house was burned to the ground. And so many of the records uh, that were in the caretaker's house were lost. This includes the church cemetery, the secular cemetery. Um, and, and so that's a great loss for us. Fortunately, a, a local genealogist, uh, Shamel Jordan, uh, started a project to map the cemetery, and she has um, she has actually created a website called Snow Hill Genealogy, where you can go 
onto the site and look at the burials of these Civil War veterans. Now, here's an interesting thing. Military service can be a research gateway. Um, this headstone for Elisha Gator is on the grounds of Mount Pisgah AME Church. This is a church where I sang on a youth choir. I um, attended regularly. Um, I walked past, I rode past. It wasn't until I moved back to New Jersey from New York and I happened to notice this very tall headstone and wonder whose headstone is that? When I investigated, I found that Mr. Gator um, tells the story of having been aboard the USS Constitution when it fired on the British ship on, um, off the coast of Nova Scotia. He was born in 1758. Um, and I'm sorry, he was born in 1788 and he died in 1858. So I began this process of trying to find out a little bit more with him. And you may not be able to see that there's some detail that after it explains who Mr. Gator is, it also says um, also his wife is very there. Now, I saw this headstone in the 1990s. I wrote a letter to the USS Constitution Museum asking them if they had any more information about him. And they directed me to several other um, potential sources like the, the National Archives, etc. cetera. Um, when I um, actually contacted them, um, I didn't get very far. I did get a little bit of information, but um, that's something where we'd like to learn more. Um, the Peter Mount House Underground Railroad Museum is undergoing some restoration. We're trying to um, uh, raise more money. And so this is a little slide about that. And so I think I'll end there. Wow. Thank you, Ms. Shockley. I really appreciated that talk. Thank you. Um, and just to let everyone know, I visited the Peter Mott House last year. And if you haven't gone to visit it, um, please um, visit it. Um, you have to actually send an email to um, visit the site. Um, so please visit their website and contact it um, and make an appointment um, when you can and learn more about the amazing work they do. Um, there are a few surviving sites of African-American um, freedom seekers and freedom fighters here in New Jersey. So um, if you can go and learn and tell your friends about it, it's great. Um, and we have also posted the link um, in the comments, and we'll also hear um, some comments from the panelists before we close. Um, so the next person that I will introduce is Dr. James Amesor. Ame Masor. Dr. James Amesor. Ame Masor. James, why have I known you now for seven years and I can never say your last name correctly? <laughs> um, besides being a panelist today, um, Dr. Amin Masur is also the supervising scholar of Black Power 19th Century, Newark's first African-American rebellion. Um, and it has been an amazing journey uh, working with him the past couple of months. But even beyond that, um, it was James who was the first person to show me how to read script from um, the 18th and 19th century. And I still remember three years ago when he sat down with a piece of paper and said, Noel, this is how you read the primary source. So many thanks to him for his leadership, insight, compassion, and um, everything that he continues to do on a daily basis for not only his students, but for community members here in Newark, New Jersey, Elizabeth, New York, throughout the nation and throughout the world. And on that note, I will introduce him. 
Um, he is a research specialist at the New Jersey Historical Society, where he utilizes the society's collections and public databases to provide assistance to researchers on a range of topics. His pilot study for the New Jersey Historical Society sponsored initiative, History, Memory and Acknowledgement, the African Diaspora in, in New Jersey has laid the essential groundwork for future research by discovering and documenting unknown and overlooked manuscript materials in the NJHS HS archives relating to people of African descent in New Jersey from colonial times. His runaway slave, his quote, runaway slave advertisements in New Jersey newspapers, 1777 to 1808, end quote, project collects, interprets, and organizes fugitive slave advertisements from a diverse array of New Jersey newspapers. Alongside his work at NJHS, Ahmed Masur teaches courses in international relations at Rutgers, New York and Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy. Prior to his graduate studies, he worked at the Cape Coast Castle Museum in Ghana, a key site to understanding the transatlantic slave trade where he coordinated educational activities for multinational visitors visiting the castle dungeons. He was featured in Traces of the Trade, A Story from the Deep North, a documentary film retracing the role of the DeWolf family of New England in the Atlantic slave trade and insurance, putting Newark on the map 2016, a documentary film celebrating Newark's 350th anniversary. Ame Masur is the co-editor of Newark Poems, a web project dedicated to the 350th anniversary of the founding of Newark. And with that, I welcome Dr. Ami Masur. Thank you. Thank you, Nua. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Bill, and the Nua Public Library for the opportunity to talk about my research on the African American experience in New Jersey. I have two projects that are ongoing. The first one, let me just share my screen. Give me a second, please. Yes, the first one, the first one is titled No Longer Unknown Manuscript Materials Relating to People of African Descent Housed in the New Jersey Historical Society Archives. It started as a pilot study in support of a New Jersey Historical Society sponsored social framework initiative titled History memory and acknowledgement, the African diaspora in New Jersey, which was directed by Dr. Linda Epps, former CEO of the New Jersey Historical Society. One of the goals of that initiative was to increase public awareness of and scholarly access to the society's collections relating to people of African descent. And my primary focus was on research, discovery, and documentation of the society's negligible but considerably unforgettable manuscript materials that reference people of African descent. Materials that were unknown or overlooked over the years and therefore have no finding aids available. Such an undertaking was deemed necessary to help broaden the understanding of and appreciation for the contributions of people of African origin, both free and enslaved to the history and development of New Jersey from the colonial period. In the process of doing that, I found references that were probably regarded as marginal or just beneath the dignity of history or either the processes simply fail to notice their significance. And they include one, new sources and resources for the study of enslavement and marginalization in New Jersey. Two, evidence that support our increasing awareness that or crazy awareness about the presence of free black people in a colonial period and long after the Revolutionary War. 
Three, evidence of free black men and women engaged in commercial activities in the 18th century and beyond. Also include evidence of free black people engaged in land deals or land transactions in the 1700s and 1800s. Research also revealed evidence of an unacknowledged black revolutionary soldier listed as quote, Simon A. Black, unquote, on the original mastered role. He was from Spotwood near New Brunswick and he served in the second regiment, Miracess County. He was unacknowledged because he was whitewashed in the official New Jersey revolutionary records. That is to say that his racial identifier, Black, became his last name in the records without any hint to his race. That is what I mean by whitewashed. Now, the research also uncovered evidence of people of African descent involved in legal and dis legal disputes or court disputes in the 1700s and 1800s. An example include a Jack, a black man versus the state of New Jersey access session dated April 1793. Seven, a community of property owned black people, men and women fulfilling their civic responsibilities in the era of enslavement right here in Newark. There were black people who were paying property tax as early as 1817 with their full names identified. Again, other evidences include one, Evidence of black led and black owned institutions, including churches here in Newark and beyond. And of course, evidence of black men or a black man called Robert Aaron of Bedminster, Somerset County, voting in the election of public officials in Bedminster in 1797 through 1800. Last but not least, the research has also uncovered evidence of reconstruction era legal and judicial interpretations of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments to the United States Constitution. And this is, this is the case with Justice P. Bradley, who, was, who studied and practiced law here in Newark before his appointment to the United States Supreme Court in 1869. Very important discovery that needs to be investigated as far as uh, citizenship and rights are concerned. It is quite a task to research and document references to marginalized people in the surviving records of the agents of marginalization. And that taking such a project requires passion, dedication, and a focus because the process is like looking for a needle in a haystack. It is a process aimed at excavating archival facts to aid the reassessment and understanding of the records that are there for acknowledgement of the contributions of African people to the history, progress, and development of New Jersey and the United States. The work, as Noel pointed out, has laid an essential ground for future research. In other words, uh, this, is, this is good. Uh, it's going to be available for anybody who is interested. It's giving us other sources that we can work with to reinterpret or reassess African people's contribution to the growth of New Jersey and the United States. My second research, which is still ongoing, is on a runaway slave advertisements in New Jersey newspapers. I was, awarded, I was awarded a research grant for this project by the New Jersey Historical Commission. The project documents and or it documents the moral and intellectual tensions between slavery and liberty in New Jersey in the period under review. That is uh, uh, between the beginning of the first continuously printed the newspaper in New Jersey at 1777. And 
the official end of the United States involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. So as you can see, this is a copy of the first or the copy of the first issue of the first continuously uh, published newspaper in New Jersey called New Jersey Gazette. Now the time period is very important because the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, made it very clear that the importation of the migration or importation of such persons into the United States at the time the Constitution was ratified, Congress shall not make any law to prohibit that until the year 1808, so 1808. So I'm looking at this time period, the first published newspaper, continuously published newspaper in New Jersey, and then the end of the transatlantic slave trade, the official end of it, that time period for my work. So as you can see, these are some of the newspapers I'm working with. I call them New Jersey's influential and forgettable newspapers. Some are very small newspapers that did not you know, last for more than a year. And the goal is to go through all these newspapers, identify every possible ad or every issue of every newspaper published in New Jersey between 1777 and 1808. And then collect all these news advertisements or anything else about people of African descent that will be made available and accessible. As I said, the project collects, transcribes, and interprets runaway slave advertisement from a diverse area of news, New Jersey newspapers that are held in repositories, both inside and outside of New Jersey. The period under review, particularly the time frame between the signing of the peace treaty that ended the Revolutionary War and that happened in 1783 and the official end of the United States involvement in the transatlantic slave trade uh, witnessed or uh, was, uh, let me say, free of major warfare, but it witnessed vibrant debates about slavery and liberty debates that tested and refined New Jersey's founding principles. So fugitive slave advertisements provide a unique perspective on those principles. And the ultimate goal of the project is to create a digital archive of flight ads that can be used by students, genealogists, heritage side educators, curriculum developers, and the general public to increase awareness of the history of slavery in New Jersey. I have quite a number of ads, I, but we don't have the time to go through them. So what I have here to highlight a few of them for you, I'm not going to read the details, but to emphasize the fact that newspapers of distant past may not be the best source of unbiased historical interpretation, but they are a treasured source because they contain information not available elsewhere. This is particularly true with flight advertisements. They are undiluted records of what slave holders had to say about their runaway property, which is true because it's coming from only slave owners and what they had to say. But they tell us a lot about what they probably did not want to reveal. And there's nowhere where you find this kind of record about enslaved people only in advertisement when they run away. That's when they have names, for instance. The first time you see that. Very often in the records, re references are to Negro man or Negro woman or wench. But in advertisements, they mention their names on almost everything about them. Now, so as I was saying, but newspapers or the ads are the stories of what I called fugitive abolitionists, because that's what they were. They were fugitives and they were abolitionists. So fugitive abolitionists and what they made of the meaning of freedom. They are a vital source of information for the study of slave resistance and culture. Quite a number of things are in there um, that, as I said, 
slave masters otherwise wouldn't have revealed about them, but they had to reveal them because they deemed them very important. So newspapers, more than any other historical sources, provide valuable windows of information, or they provide valuable window into how fugitive slave cultures and conditions shaped New Jersey's history. Specifically, flight ads furnish both visceral and cerebral interpreted, interpretive uh, openings into slaveholders and enslaved people's reactions to the ideals spawned by the American Revolution. And that ideal was liberty. So it is this where you see what reactions and slave people and their owners, how they all reacted to these ideals. But as descriptive images, runaway slave ads provide unadulterated means of getting the moral dimensions of slavery into the public consciousness. In other words, African people were very often advertised in images of this kind. So for us in New Jersey and beyond to get the moral dimension of what slavery actually meant into a public consciousness, we have to resort to ads because they give us quite a lot of information. Now the project when completed will be an invitation to a better understanding of the history of New Jersey and the United States in a sense that the American experiment was imperfect from the very start. The revolution advanced ideals of human or universal human equality, but left intact the economic and social underpinnings of slavery. Those ideals nevertheless had their effects on all sides, and they did, and slave people and slaveholders, slave traders, and slave catchers, abolitionists and judicial officers all had to grapple with the reality and promise of freedom in a post-revolutionary landscape. So this is what I'm doing. In other words, two main projects. One is about documenting all kinds of sources for, to lay the groundwork for further research. And the second project focuses on runaway slave advertisements, which are a very important source for us to get the moral dimensions of slavery into a public consciousness. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much for that. Um, it, I have to say, one of the things you said um, as you were doing the presentation that was so powerful that I just had to comment on um, before we introduce Crystal Langford um, is that, that in the advertisements, the enslavers had to name the enslaved. So we look in these books for those who are not um, lay researchers or or um, humanity specialists like I am, or professors like, like um, Dr. Amos, Amamastor and Dr. Matthews, um, is that we're often looking at ledgers where people just write a black wench or a black woman, but in the advertisement, so in this realm of capitalism, there's a crisis that happens. They must not just acknowledge a name, but even you showed an advertisement where they actually advertised, they had to do the name, the primary name and the nickname, right? So without this crisis that happens in the capitalism and the economic system of reclaiming this, this property that you think you own, um, you have to acknowledge the humanity or actually the beingness of um, something or someone that you claim to be property. So that's amazing. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. I would like to introduce the next panelist. Um, the next panelist is Ms. Lankford. Welcome. Thank you. 
So Crystal Langford is the educational consultant and historian for the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project in East Brunswick, New Jersey. She teaches courses on the Black woman experience and the psychology of African Americans as an adjunct professor at William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey. She is a doctoral candidate at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, as she serves on the Civil Rights Commission for her hometown of Bloomfield, New Jersey right up the avenue, <laughs> where she resides with her husband and four of their children. Her oldest son is stationed in Japan, proudly serving in the United States Air Force. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Noelle, for um, inviting me to this um, awesome, this phenomenal panel to discuss um, my role in telling the histories of um, African Americans, particularly in New Jersey. Um, so. Let me share my screen. I'm hoping I'm doing this right. So this is not it. Can you guys see it? It's it's loading. Okay. Is it Derek now or? Uh, no, it's still loading. Let me see. Oh, yes, it's there. It's beautiful. Okay, perfect. Um, I just want to make sure that you guys are able, is it moving or no, not yet? Is it still on the homepage? It moved to the second slide. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the story that I'm actually going to tell you about um, is about the Lost Souls of 1818. And um, I came into this work again, uh, as you mentioned, as a learning consultant. Um, I was brought on to develop educational materials for the local community from which uh, these souls are actually stolen from. Um, so, like many of us, um, like uh, uh, Dr. Emma. Masur has said, um, a lot of us don't know this uh, history in terms of the, the depth of, of slavery or the intricacies of slavery uh, in New Jersey. And um, this story in particular, The Lost Souls, actually stood out to me um, because of the exploitation of familial bonds, right? So um, the exploitation between, you know, uh, mothers and their children, um, in addition to fathers who are looking for work of our freed um, Black people who are looking for work to support their families. Um, so this story is important because um, in 1804, New Jersey actually promised, you know, children uh, born to enslaved women um, freedom, right? And like uh, Dr. Matthew said earlier, right, there is a certain time there is a, an age, right, that they would acquire freedom, right? So if it's a female born at the age of 21, they would gain their freedom. And if they were, um, once they uh, reached the age of 25, they were male, then they would then gain uh, their freedom. But despite this law of, so that time in between, they were still seen um, as enslaved property. So they were still treated as slave. They received the, the punishments, the, you know, they were sent out to work, um, you know, to Philadelphia in neighboring uh, states, right? So, you know, they were still getting the, the masters or plantation owners were still receiving some kind of um, monetary gain for, you know, the, the, the enslaved work. So, um, so there is a lot of movement, right? So um, with enslaved folks, you know, children and mothers, fathers, you know, moving outside, in and outside the state with their masters, right? So we have, um, because we have this influx in, in terms of this movement, right? So New Jersey, in a sense, kind of like tighten up their laws. They were like, okay, well, if you want to move outside of the state um, or travel outside of the state, you need to cons you need to gain consent, right, of the enslaved person, right? So uh, it's like, okay, well, these enslaved people have rights, in a sense. That's what this law is telling us. And um, so pretty much what would happen is the enslaved person must, if they agreed, they have to one, agree to leave the state with their enslaver, right? However, their decision needed to be verified, it needed to be approved and certified in front of two judges of the courts. Um, this is where we see an exploitation of a loophole, right? So 
knowing that enslaved people really don't have agency, it's like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, say that these people agreed to move out of the state, right? So we have um, political figures who are holding um, offices of public trust, right? So the, the, the gentleman that I have in front of me, on in front of you guys, his name is uh, Judge Jacob Van Wickle. He was a, um, a judge. He sat on the, the courts in Middlesex County. And um, he decided he wanted to exploit the law uh, to, to, to gain, to make as much money as possible, considering the economy in New Jersey was shifting. Right, so you have this booming Southern economy, right? And it, you know, cotton, is king cotton, cotton is king. So we have, you know, sugar fields and, uh, and things of that nature that's booming in the South, whereas we have the shift in New Jersey. So the enslaved population is not going to be worth as much um, in the North as, as it is in the South. However, Jacob, uh, Judge Jacob Van Wickle, he, did, he wasn't at this work alone. Right, so he um, has a brother-in-law who um, his name was uh, Charles Morgan, who actually was a Louisiana state legislator, and he owned um, uh, a plantation in Point Coupe, Point Coupe, Louisiana. And just you know, as a side note, so the images that I have um, on the presentation, they are not um, they, they're just representation, right? So they are not the uh, enslaved people. They're not the law. Souls. So there's just, you know, just to give you guys a visual. So uh, Charles Morgan, again, he has, he purchased, re recently purchased this plantation and he's looking for people to till his land, right? So in the South, an enslaved person, right, can cost upwards of $800. However, in the North, it's not that much. So we're looking at $175, as little as $175. So he decided he wanted to come up north. Um, he, he made a stop, he was heading to Virginia first. And then he was like, ah, you know something, let me go to New Jersey to go see my brother-in-law. And they, they came up with this plan to buy as many slaves, enslaved people as possible. And um, this is how, right, we see the interstate uh, slave trade um, begin to uh, uh, take shape, right? So the, um, there was a, a, a so we ended the international slave trade in 1808. So now this one picks up, right? Because we're no longer getting, getting a supply from Africa or from the Caribbean. So we're, only, we're, we're left to rely on the enslaved folks within the United States, within, within this nation. So anywho, um, again, he comes up with this plan. Uh, but again, he is not the only one who is um, taking part of this uh, this ring. So because Van Wickle was um, connected, him and Charles Morgan, right, politically connected, they had access to a lot of uh, people, they had access to a lot of um, sources. Um, again, when you look at the, uh, the 1812 law, which says you need to verify in front of two judges, he would collaborate with VWF Alcult, and this uh, judge over here, or John Smith, that's another judge. Um, they would he would collaborate with, right, to sign these, uh, um, to sign the certificate of removal. Again, when according to them, these people, these enslaved folks gave their consent. And for young children, they gave their assent, right? Saying that they wanted to go to the South um, to, to till the lands. So um, again, Van Wickle, you know, he was connected with um, notorious uh, uh, slave traders. For example, Lewis Compton was one of them. Um, uh, kidnapper Peter Hendry, he was also notorious. You have some transporter of slaves. So these are the people who would um, take the enslaved people, right? Who, according to Van Wickle, sold their freedom away to head south, right? So you had these people who would pick these enslaved people up and then bring them to the dock uh, from Perth Amboy or um, Sandy Hook and then head down to Louisiana, head down to the south. Um, and so again, so this is just a snippet in terms of um, the people that I was able to uh, research and find who was involved in the slave ring. 
judge, he was, the, the judge actually was, he was smart, he was cunning. <laughs> Let me not say smart. He was uh, very cunning in the sense that he didn't conduct these illegal, this illegal business in, you know, in, in his office, whatever that was back then at the courthouse. Um, he did this in his home, right? So on his first attempt, uh, judge Jacob Van Winkle, along with the other judges, so one of the other two, they falsified 73 enslaved um, people for removal out of New Jersey and to, headed to Louisiana. Of the 13, I'm, I'm sorry, of the 73, we had 13 children. The youngest that we do know of goes, his name was Joseph. He was two days old. And um, of course, the law says, you need to have a sense. Like the, the, the child must agree along with the parent, right? So what happened with Joseph, he cried. Because he cried, Judge Jacob Valley was like, okay, he gave a cent. So they signed a certificate of removal for a baby Joseph. In addition to, um, in addition to, well, convincing women to uh, um, head, head south, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, they also exploit the vulnerabilities of um, enslaved, I'm sorry, not enslaved people. They exploit the vulnerabilities of freed people. So you had some black people who um, were looking for work, both men and women, who were looking for work, right? And well, what happened is you had um, Emmeline, who is Van Wickle's a uh, daughter-in-law who would approach these people who are who are at their wits end and promise them employment. Say, like, okay, well, if you head south, we're going. We promise you're going to get you're going you're going to find work, and then you're going to work for a certain amount of time, and then you're going to come back up. And so, don't get me wrong, right? So there were other um, people who were engaged in uh, in the business of you know um, finding people who were looking for work, they would sign a contract, they would head out and then they would come come back. But in this instance, we don't know whether or not these um, free people um, came back, the ones who, but we know that they were lied to. Um, and then another vice that uh, Van Wickle and his uh, cronies, his group of people uh, uh, used was kidnapping, right? So for example, we had Claus and thank you Noel for that term, right? So these freedom seekers, Claus was a freedom seeker. Claus ran away from his um, owner um, in search of freedom and he was caught. And he was brought to the courthouse in Central Jersey, Middlesex County, he was brought to the courthouse um, to stand a uh, trial, I guess. And um, he was supposed to be seen like the following day. So they kept them, they kept them there. And what ended up happening was you had an officer of the court who actually snuck him out and brought him to Van Wickle's home, right? So where he would be processed and sent south. So they kidnapped, they were kidnapping folks from, well, in this instance, they kidnapped Claus from the courthouse. Um, they were also kidnapping children. Remember I said earlier, right? So you had uh, masters or because they became up into sound. So you had masters who would release out their, 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 their children, their enslaved property. And um, so you had, in this case, 14 year old Peter who was sent to Philadelphia. He was sent to Philadelphia and never came back, right? So we learned that Peter was actually kidnapped and um, he was actually um, awaiting uh, to be um, placed on a ship, on, on one of the uh, four ships headed to Louisiana. And how we actually found out that Peter was kidnapped is because an officer of the court, another one, was actually sent to uh, Van Wickle's home um, in present-day East Brunswick. Back then it was uh, South River, but present-day East Brunswick they went to his home and then that's when they found Peter, right? So this officer also said, oh, well, I seen a whole bunch of black folks there as well. Like, it, and he was like, uh, Van Wickle's home looked like a garrison. It, it, it looks like a prison, like it's well guarded. So we have Peter who is found and, and brought back. And then we have an, um, other children who were kidnapped, another kid named Peter and his brother, Harry. And, um, those two, right? So according to the documents, it's like you need parent permission. So when we look at the certificate of removal, they say, okay, well, their parents can't be found. They have no parents. So because they have no parents, you're, they, they gave permission, they gave us uh, a consent, we can send them south. So we had children who, again, who were kidnapped. Then we have um, 
the, the, uh, the third instance where, well, another instance, not so much a third, um, is for Black people who could not prove their status, right? Because the, um, well, talking about uh, Black communities, talking about like um, in New Brunswick, we have a town called Half Penny Town, where there you have, you know, free Black people who live um, within that uh, vicinity. In addition, you had like propertyless white people who lived um, within Half Penny Town. And at the entrance of Half Penny Town, there is the, the city jail, right? So Black people freed, right, uh, had to walk past the city jail, right, just to get out of Half Penny Town. And um, so what would happen is if you could not prove your status as a free person, they would jail you. And this is the, we don't know if that's the case for Betsy, um, but we know that um, Betsy was in the city jail um, in, in New Brunswick. And because of Van Wickle's connections, he, it's the governor, uh, the then governor of the state actually gave him permission to acquire Betsy. So the thing is with um, p Black folks who were in, uh, who were um, imprisoned, um, for lack of a better uh, term, if they had 10 days, so they had 10 days for their master to come and claim them. And after 10 days, if they weren't claimed, then they would get sold, right? So again, we don't know the case of Betsy, whether or not she was a freed woman or whether or not her master just never came, but we know that she was sold and she was placed on one of the ships headed south to Louisiana. Van Wickle, he, what he did, uh, he looked to um, his friends who were slave owners or slave holders and who were willing to, slave, to sell um, enslaved children. Um, young, we have young mothers like Christine. I believe Christine was actually like 16, 17. She was young and she had two children. Um, and then Rachel, as well as Lydia Ann. So we have these young mothers who, according to the law, because they were born before 1804, they weren't granted freedom, right? Like um, uh, Dr. Matthew said earlier, it's like, okay, the law was never amended, right? So you have these mothers who uh, have these children. However, their, their child is born after the 4th of July. They're, the law says that they are free, right? After they reach a certain age. However, these mothers did not want to be separated from their children, right? So <laughs> It, you know, they're, as African Americans, the 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 dream and the hope is always on freedom, is always on liberty, right? So for the child, for their children to actually have this opportunity to be free, right? Of course, Van Wickle and his folks lied to them, right? So they say, okay, well, you'll be with them and you send them south. However, that was not guaranteed that they would remain as a, a unit in terms of um, them being a, a family unit. So again, so Van Wickle exploited that. Van Wickle and his crew exploited that bond, that mother and child bond. Also ex um, exploited the uh, father's or you know, the the, the caregivers' role, the, who was able to provide economic relief um, or sustain the family economically in wh whatever way they could. Um, he exploited that. So what I have for before you is actually a timeline. I won't go into the timeline per se. However, I will talk about um, the, the, the not so much the transition, right? So we see four um, exodus out, outside of the state of New Jersey. So with that, we have at least, we know of at least 137 um, lost souls who were shipped um, on one of these four um, vessels, right? So between March 22nd and late October of 1818. So once these lost souls arrived uh, to the to to their destination, be it Louisiana um, or Alabama. Uh, so once they arrived, um, they were the, the ships. All four, well, three. Not I don't know about the fourth one, but three of the ships are actually um, apprehended, right? So and they were accused. So the captain of the ships were accused of smuggling, which they were. They were smuggling um, these human beings um, who. Again, a lot of them were kidnapped, um, who were going there against their will. Um, so there was this suspicion. 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 So what happened was the um, state of Louisiana actually held these um, these people um, as property of the state, right? So it, as opposed to looking the, looking at them as uh, victims of um, of smuggling, right? So they held them as 
property of the state. Um, so we're still doing more research to um, see, you know, what came of them. However, um, my work as an educator, I'm looking at the ways in which um, these lost souls uh, resisted, right? So many of them moaned, right? They grumbled. And we know this because James Elaine, who was a passenger on one of, on the first uh, ship, the Mary Ann, um, he, he said he heard them. He heard these men um, who were on these, on these um, vessels complaining that they were kidnapped. Another woman by the name of Susan Wilcox, um, and Hannah informed, um, uh, you can call them like present day um, US customs, um, a person by the name of Beverly Chu is like, okay, well, we were brought here against our will. So we see these, um, these um, acts of resistance, right? Maybe not the violent ones that we um, know about. However, it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging this uh, condition, the state that I'm, in, that I'm in, right? So my children were promised freedom. Um, I probably was a free person. However, now I'm stated to be enslaved for life. So, you know, after hearing all of this, right, so New Jersey citizens, right, in particular, we have 103 citizens in the Middlesex County who um, they're hearing the story and they're just bothered by what is taking place, what is taking place by uh, the judge, what is taking place with the governor, what is taking place with other folks that we trust, right, to make these laws to protect us or, you know, so it, again, they're, they're bothered by it and they petition the courts to, um, to change the laws or hold these people accountable. No one was held accountable uh, in terms of the, the architects of the, um, of the Van Wickle slavery wasn't held accountable. We do have um, records of them going to court, for example, um, Nicholas, who was Van Wickle's son, we have evidence of them being found guilty, but again, they weren't um, held accountable. So they, they petitioned the courts, um, they challenged, they appealed the decision. But um, because of the work of these citizens in Middlesex County, it brought a um, it, it it brought it to a grinding halt, right? So we still had um, um, souls who were leaving New Jersey, right, against their will, but. Um, it, it kind of like slowed down the process. It, ma it made it much more difficult because, you know, the, the customs are on high alert. People are on the, commun the community on high alert and black folks are on high alert. So um, again, today we have learned the names of 137 souls and thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I follow the Lost Souls Memorial on, um, Facebook and on Instagram and um, their journey to um, create a memorial for these um, victims of slavery and white supremacy, racism and trafficking. And one of the things, Crystal, thank you for the points in um, your piece. I would like to welcome everyone back um, to the discussion. Um, is that one of the tactics they're using that I'm sure they used in Africa, but that they're using even to this day now, are, it is the fact of offering maybe some of these people who were not just like actively just stolen, um, the promise of work. Something that's now going on in Italy other European countries, the United States, um, from, from, from people who are often offered domestic work in houses who are underpaid to people who are sex trafficked around the world in the country. This is something um, that just continues now and it's increased you know, so thank you for making those um, connections. Um, and so um, since we're closing, I just wanted to ask you all um, if you had any points that you would like to share. Um, and if not, if there are, what would you say are the most urgent issues um, that researchers, and site preservationists um, of Black um, 
free communities and enslaved communities in New Jersey are facing right now. Um, so um, if anyone has any closing comments or they would like to respond to that question, please, um, please share with us. Well, I think this is James. Uh, um, I would like to just emphasize an article that uh, the president, the current president of Rutgers University published on the 10th of uh, February. Uh, it's an opinion piece in the New York Times and the title is, isn't 400 years enough? With a subtitle that says, the failure to appreciate black history leaves our nation incomplete. I just want everybody to look for that article, read it and think about his subtitle, the failure to appreciate black history this foundation mm. incomplete. Why? Because America, United States history is about freedom. Uh, and that is the most essential thing. And uh, the freedom is just wrapped around black experience largely uh, from the very beginning. Uh, freedom as a practical thing, not as a theoretical discipline, but you know, as a practical thing, that is where you get what freedom really means from when Black folks first came here up to today. And so if we are going to have a complete nation and then we have to actually appreciate Black history and accept that. And not only our nation, but the failure to appreciate Black history leaves us individuals also incomplete, not only the nation. Uh, we have to make that very central. Um, there is a book out there by, uh, uh, Columbia University professor, forgotten the name, but the title of the book is, is Freedom as an American Story, The Story of American Freedom, The Story of American Freedom. That's a very good book, which treats freedom as a historical process rather than as a conceptual thing. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank um, the, the other panelists for the education they provided. Uh, for lay people who are stumbling around, looking at Ancestry.com, um, thinking maybe I ought to go to the state archives or the state library, um, what you provided is very helpful because we're looking for research and understanding ourselves, particularly in a community like ours, and what you provided is tremendously helpful and, and thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback off of um, what uh, James was talking about um, in terms of referencing uh, the president's opinion piece, <laughs> black history is American history and we definitely have to recognize that. So, and uh, 400 Souls, the, the new book that just came out by uh, Keisha Blaine, Annie Ryan Kendi, she, she, she harps on that and it's important Right, it's important work that we must do, that we must integrate this within the education system, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for us to move forward and achieve, right, this freedom that we've long been talking about and we, we visualize, um, we must begin teaching young children. Educators must um, become engrossed within the literature to understand themselves in the context of the American story, as well as being able to move beyond right, the emotions to begin teaching children, black, white, brown, everyone about this history. So that again, so that we may move forward. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a really powerful statement, and I just wanted to add also that I learned a great deal from the work you all are doing, um, and as an archaeologist, one of our biggest concerns is the preservation of historic sites. Um, there's a record in the archaeological, or there's an archaeological record associated with people of color, people of African descent that adds a great deal to what we can get from the archives. Um, everybody lives somewhere, and they often left things behind. Uh, and so it's great to see um, what, you know, the site where you are, Linda, uh, I don't know if you've considered having archaeology there, but you, you might, you might want to follow up on that and I happy to talk to you about it another time. Right. But the, the identification of sites associated with African American history in New Jersey, their preservation, perhaps their archaeological study, if there's any reason to, 
uh, that I would like to see a lot more of that as well and not make it, I mean, it, so for example, go to these sites that we know a lot of uh, history about, you know, because they're associated with famous colonists, you know, and to say like a lot of those folks were slave owners and the mm -hmm. story of those enslaved people are, is there. We just right. have to, have to d demand access and, and the right to know it. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Okay, I would like to say thank you all for those closing comments. And I think one of the essential um, foundational points that I want people to draw from the exhibition and from these panels um, that the art and beauty of black power um, is that the uh, history of African-American um, liberation and contributions to understanding what democracy is in the United States is a long history. Um, it did not start in the 1960s or the 1950s with a couple of people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman who like showed up in the 1800s. Rather, this has been a protracted um, fight and struggle, and in many cases, in some cases, win um, for Black individuals, but also Black communities um, and people of color communities and folks who identified as Black, these Native American, African American, mixed race people, um, folks from who, who came here from the Caribbean. Um, some who traveled with some of these plantation owners to Northern New Jersey, um, folks who moved from the South, like um, Henry Drayton, who was a part of Denmark Vesey's, um, who was accused of being a part of Denmark Vesey's revolution, who then moved here to New York and continued his work, um, Henry Drayton. And so that is the, if there's one thing someone should leave this experience um, today with is that this, there is a long history of African-American, poor, middle-class and wealthy people for hundreds of years fighting for liberation. But also that there are these people like Dr. Amin Masur, Crystal Langford, Linda Shockley, Dr. Christopher Matthews, um, who are all working to unveil this history, that there are um, dozens and hundreds of people who are doing this work and you can connect to it. Um, we feature some of these um, projects on the Black Power 19th Century um, site. Um, and we encourage you to visit. Please look through the um, chat and view the links there as well. Um, and so I want to thank everyone again for appearing on this panel and sharing your years and years and years, of sometimes decades of expertise um, today. And I encourage people to connect. Um, so thank you. Um, I would also like to extend a thank you to the development um, office at the Newark Public Library. Their work is essential in um, providing support for these programs um, that the Newark Public Library continues to present to the public. Um, thank you to the leadership of Dr. Ingrid Bentecourt, um, as well as the James Brown African American Room librarian, Dale Colston who continues to lead the African-American programming at Newark Public Library, including the Black History Celebration, but the programming that goes on throughout the year and continues to be, um, work with the other leadership of Newark Public Library to serve the city of Newark in the greater state of New Jersey. Thank you to Reginald Blanding, who also contributed to um, this series um, and who is also a panelist and continues to serve um, in the African American room, as well as the rest of the staff of the James Brown African American room. Thank you to Diego Quintero, um, in our the the director of our IT department um, group staff. Um, thank you to Nita Santiago, um, who works in accounting, and also many thanks to my partner Sharon Davis, who um, allows me to. Um, really shirk a lot of duties within our home to do this research at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and finally, many thanks to the PNC Foundation 
who, as I said in the last panel, funded this series, but also funds places like the National Museum of African American History in DC and projects throughout the state. And they don't back away from radical issues that deal with African American issues. And that, that is amazing. Um, in the New Jersey Historical Commission that does the same thing, this is our third year funding for them. Um, they funded our Radical Women exhibition and now Black Power 19th Century. They're not afraid, they want to be, they want the community in New Jersey to be a part of this dialogue. Um, please visit our website, blackpower19thcentury.com um, um, for the virtual exhibition as well as our resource page and everything else. And the exhibition will be opening later in the spring um, in late May. And I think I've said thank you to everyone, but the participants, <laughs> who the folks who are watching this program now and the folks who will be watching it tomorrow, and if I'm going to be Afrofuturistic, um, the folks who will be watching it in months and years, and um, to the researchers who will be watching this and then developing new avenues of research, whether you're a lay person or whether you're someone in an educational um, institution, um, your work, your questions are essential. Thank you to all of the people who gave us great comments in the chat. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to address it, but um, hopefully if you have any other questions, you can address us on the site or email um, the, the folks um, who participated. And with that, I would just like to say um, thank you all and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.